Ladies and gentlemen, despite that we couldn't meet face to face, I'm very pleased that this conference could take place and I could approach you with my presentation. It would be great if we could meet in the banks of Danube, having a dinner and a sip of red wine in Old Town, enjoying the atmosphere of Central Europe, but nevertheless, I will try to do my best to at least start at that point. I was born in the very east of Slovakia, where borders were moved often, and my own ancestors were a part of emigration waves hundreds of years ago. About 1 million people have emigrated from Slovakia since 1880, according to estimations, and we are a country of about 5 million. Brain drain in the region never stopped, and 80% each of a grammar school students from the small town I was born in left the region in the past decade. I started studying psychology after the Velvet Revolution, and when I finished my master's degree, they offered me to continue a PhD study in a pioneer collaboration between the Groningen University in the Netherlands and several Central European universities, which aim not only to promote research in public health in Central Europe, but also to prevent brain drain. Students were fully supported by the Groningen University, but kept living and working at their home university. It was a very challenging program, and after more than 20 years, without a doubt, it fulfilled its mission. Dr. van Dijk was awarded by a royal decoration for the important contribution he has made to solving public health and healthcare problems in Central Europe. More than 30 young, talented scientists defended their PhD thesis in Groningen, went on to have a successful research career, and the vast majority of them didn't abandon their home country. This also immensely contributed to a change in a research culture and its cultivation. This program spreads across the border to Olomouc in the Czech Republic, where one of the most dynamic research groups in the field of health psychology was established. From the beginning, the interest of our research group was the health of groups vulnerable due to age, chronic illness or social status, and therefore we were naturally inclined towards health psychology. Later on, we discovered that there was an informal group of professionals interested in health psychology in Slovakia already in the 80s, fueled by the enthusiasm and commitment of Professor Kondaš and Professor Košt. The health psychology section within the Slovak Psychological Association was created in 1995 by Dr. Dušan Celko and Associate Professor Milada Harinekova. Since 2006, a national conference of health psychology has been organized mainly thanks to Dr. Dušan Celko and later on, the first national delegate within the European Health Psychology Society on behalf of Slovakia was approved in 2007. Since that time, the number of researchers working on health psychology topics increased, but unfortunately the tradition of national conferences vanished, so we only see each other thanks to annual conferences of European Health Psychology Society. I tried to name researchers whose publications fit into the field, but the list should be much longer, and the variety of research topics is remarkable. Health psychology is still not recognized as a specialization in Slovakia, however, a relevant content might be found in the course of many study programs since 2002, and this year, for the first time, a PhD program in health psychology was launched in the Comenius University in Bratislava. I am extremely pleased that one of the newborn's first visitors in Euro is European Health Psychology Society. I wish that it will facilitate the development of a critical mass of experts, will help to recognize a need for this specialization and will initiate further steps in establishing this profession in Slovakia. This would not have happened if Rado Masaryk and many others hadn't taken the button and hadn't run toward uncertainty. My presentation will focus on telling patient stories online as new territory in health psychology, which might sound strange as patient stories are core to health psychology, right? Particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, there is a lot of work within medical education, a lot of work with regard to patient empowerment and support, and a lot of work in sensitization of public discourse, which should be done to improve chances for improving efficiency of healthcare system, improving benefit of patients from offered services, and improving their and their relatives' chances for quality of life. Being able to collect and use patient stories might be a tool toward this change. 
Listening and telling stories is the most natural, powerful and effective way of learning about the world. It's the way we build our memories, build our experience and transfer it. It's the way we make sense of our experience resulting in hurt or heal, trauma or growth. It's our story that we are telling when we are asked what happened to us if we became ill. How it affects our daily living, how it affects our relationship with loved ones, friends and colleagues at work. How we tell them about it, how we are able or unable to do the activities we used to do. What care treatment we choose and how it goes on is what we used to report. It's our perspective. Experiential information is shared through people's stories. But there is a parallel universe based on science, built on definitions, terms, classifications, procedures, using all kinds of high technology and having its own language. The medical information, or rather the information mostly shared by the medical staff, is from a different point of view. It has a different purpose and different content compared to the information shared by patients. While in one universe the level of insulin is an issue, in that parallel one the love expressed in eating dinner cooked by a wife might be the issue. Being a patient means living in both universes and a healthcare professional should be familiar with both, should be able to navigate a patient in both of them. What do we mean by telling stories online? I tried to find keywords which could bring me to the relevant content and I was trying following ones. Patient experience, patient narratives, patient's perspective, experiential evidence, experiential information, experiential websites, story bank, patient online groups and blogs. Sue so Ziblund and Sally Weick published a very comprehensive conceptual review of literature in social and health sciences on how sharing experiences on the internet might affect people's health and part of this review is an outline of the main ways in which patients' health experiences appear online. They listed the general health information sites like NHS, which include patients' real stories to illustrate health condition, blogs about health conditions like eating disorder, weight loss, cancer, social networking websites like Facebook or Twitter, where you could search, for example, on BBC Health, online forums on health issues supported by patient stories, homemade videos and illustrations posted on YouTube, Flickr, online collections of video and audio on health experiences like Health Talk Org, testimonials, for example, on quitting smoking, smoking decision-making aids, utilizing short video clips of people describing their own experience and reasoning, consumers' reviews or reputation sites. I tried to go through online resources listed in this review published in 2012 and I found that many of them do not operate anymore. Taking into account how much capacity, energy and time need to be invested in, in the development and implementation of such online resources to reach the goal in terms of increased quality of life in patients, increased quality of health care, we should value a robust initiative with, su sufficient, with sufficient sustainability if there is any like that, a lot. I will come back to this when introducing the DIPEX initiative. Considering how crucial and essential the role of sharing experiences and telling stories is, I try to find out how we articulate in literature why we are aiming to share patient stories, what is the purpose and how it could affect health. Lisa Morrison and Katty Jill Stevens formulate the following three possible goals. To evoke strong emotion for lobbying or fundraising context. To promote empathy and understanding of what might be helpful in supporting the culture shift and to promote change that might be helpful in influencing the process or policy. 20 years ago, Rita Haron from Columbia University published her essay in YAMA introducing narrative medicine as a model for respectful, empathic and nourishing medical care. Narrative competence understood as the ability to listen, acknowledge, interpret and respond to patient stories is a core concept of this approach. So we might aim to share patient stories to develop narrative competence as a part of medical education and also acknowledge them as an essential part of medical profession, expecting that physicians will be able to not only understand the disease and treat medical problems, but also to accompany patients through their illness. 
Whether we intended it or not, sharing patients' experiences could affect health of those who listen. Susie Blond and Sally Weick identify these seven domains through which online patients' experiences could affect their health. Their review is a masterpiece which I could only highly recommend to read in full length, but for the lack of the time I will just cherry-pick from this rich material. People could find the information they need in a way they easily understand. How did you know that something went wrong? Who did you go to? How did it go? What were your options? How did you decide? Were your decision good? Oh, what was your experience? What about your wife? How did you tell your children or friends? Did they know about it already? One can get a number of simple tips like how to deal with everyday problems, advice about what has worked for the others. It might help them to understand what's going on and what might happen. And most importantly, people can return to this resource repeatedly whenever they need something and choose only what they need and can do it anywhere while having privacy. However, if this source of patient experience doesn't reflect the real experience of patients, it's biased or even intentionally manipulated in a certain direction for commercial or other purpose, it may be detrimental for its consumers. Also, if patients feel overloaded by information or the information is seen as conflicting, it can lead to confusion, anxiety and undermine the patient's decision making. Listening to the stories of others about the path we are walking help us believe that we are not alone that what we are experiencing is not strange. It brings a sense of belonging and reassurance. The benefit is that we feel supported. Despite knowing that others have coped with illness can give the patient hope, it might bring also unrealistic expectations, false hopes and feelings of inadequacy if others seem to be managing better. When the stories of others provide us with a safe guidance across the land of disease, we are much better prepared to settle in it, invite friends, resume the activities we used to do. It might enable relationships with others of same kinship and full adjustment to a new life situations, including maintaining relationship with others. Unfortunately, some people might decide to keep relationships only within that kinship believe that only those who have been through the same thing can understand them and keep isolated from the real world. Describing experiences with health services might be a kind of navigation through the care system and it might help patients ask better questions, realize their own symptoms or side effects and make the consultation more effective. These stories might help improve the services. Julia Derbyshire and Lisa Hinton go back to the database of inter interviews with former intensive care unit patients created within DPEX, and from their experiences with noise, uh, they tried to identify areas uh, with potential for improvement. It was presented to healthcare staff as a trigger film, and it helped raise awareness of the effect that high noise levels could have on patients, and it initiated simple environmental changes new teaching materials and visual display of live sounds levels on intensive care units would definitely improved healthcare. It was also the example of how patients' experience might stimulate advocacy and campaigns. On the other side, online space is full of exaggerated or angry stories about poor care which might discourage some patients, lower their confidence in doctors in general and adherence to treatment. Patients' experiences might be misused to manipulate consultation, pretend or exaggerate symptoms. Personally, I found learning to tell the story an extremely important domain. From the stories of others, we learn how to describe what we experience. We expand our vocabulary, we became more sensitive to our experiences and we became better observers and reporters. Is it not what we want from our patients during medical consultation to be a well-trained observer and reporter? Moreover, the process of constructing a coherent story is a part of the healing process, helps people make a sense of what happened to them and support their emotional mastery. Photographs and video clips enable us to visualize disease. A thousand words are equal to one sip of red wine. 
the fact that we can see and listen to another person who has passed or is going through the path that await us will help us establish a relationship with ourselves on that path to visualize ourselves. What is it like to not have hair or to have a missing breast? How much will ticks change my ability to communicate with people? However, people with serious progressive conditions might be frightened by images of other people in poor health. The very last and very important domain mentioned by Sue Ziblon and Sarah Weick is affecting behavior. Personal narrative could inspire and encourage a change in behavior, could build confidence and also counteract other personal narrative. In present time, it might be personal stories of unvaccinated regretting their decision versus stories of those rejecting vaccination. There is no doubt about the potential and power of telling patient stories, but we should be alert. As there are resources promoting anorexia, unsafe weight loss or providing advice on how to most effectively contract HIV or commit suicide, where full content is dangerous, and also a vast amount of online content without validation, guarantee, regulation, or with commercial purpose, up to unintentional and desirable side effects, and be aware about both potential for harm as well as benefit. Sharing patient stories, if done well, might indeed have a huge impact on the quality of life of patients and their relatives, might improve quality of health care and consequently, consequently also patient safety. Patient safety is a priority of this decade, as it was announced by WHO. As I already mentioned once, patient stories should be a core business of health psychology. So, are they? There are around 700,000 hits for patient experience narratives or per perspective in Web of Science, from which only up to 600 are published in health psychology journals, which compose about 4% of its production, and none of them with the keyword DPEX. But what is DPEX? The database of individual patients' experience was launched in July 2001, so two decades ago, with a module of hypertension and prostate cancer. It happened thanks to two doctors, Dr. Anne McPherson and Dr. Andrew Herxheimer. They were encouraged to do so by their own experience with the disease. Anne was diagnosed with breast cancer and despite being a doctor and knowing the medical side of the disease, she couldn't find anyone to talk to about her disease. Sharing experiences about between them didn't end like most discourses like that as a series of anecdotes, but it led to the idea of creating a web portal where people could get verified, organized information on various topics from people who had a similar experience. In present time, the network includes 14 countries, covers nearly 200 health conditions, and reaches a million people each year. It's an international association of expert researchers conducting quali qualitative research into people's experience of health and illness, and their mission is to improve the understanding of personal health experience from, for the benefit of patients and families, our communities, researchers, and the health sector, including healthcare professionals and policymakers. So, how does it work? The researchers need to be experienced in qualitative research method and receive accredited training in the DPEX method and are supported by a body and and a multidisciplinary expert advisory panel. This panel is created for each topic and it's composed of experts, healthcare workers, patients, ideally also patients with medical education, representatives of patient organizations and family members. Their task is to assist and oversee that the topic is truthfully prepared and processed. Researcher teams need to be acquainted with the team and beside the literature review, meetings with patients and experts are used to as a source uh, of information and expertise, which allow them to also prepare for interviews and establish a network of potential respondents. For each health topic, they will address 30 to 50 respondents who are willing to talk about their experience, agree with processing of information uh, and a publication in the form of videos, audios or transcripts on web portals. Respondents have the option to protect their identity if they wish to do it. The aim is to capture the widest possible range of experiences and therefore participants are selected according to maximum variation sampling. 
The interviews are then processed by qualitative methods and the results of these analyses are, in addition to scientific outputs, processed into a web presentation. And this proce processing consists of the structure of topics, accompanying text and clips, a short parts of interviews arranged according to these topics. At the same time, they must adhere to very strict standards for conducting uh, the interview, processing the information as well as sharing it. Each clip is transcript, so even if you couldn't understand well, you could follow the message via transcript and you could Google Translate it. Modules undergo activalization when some new diagnostic or treatment is implemented with significant impact on patient's experience. Each module includes patient's profiles where you could find the patient's age in the interview, the age when diagnosed, the background of the patient, brief outline of the disease and all short clips from interview with this patient. So one could easily look for someone close to his or her situation or learn more about background of the experience shared in clips. For some teams, you could find a trigger film. It's a robust repository of patient experience of high quality already, allowing for comparisons across health conditions, facilitating comparison across countries and health systems, proving its sustainability over two decades, unlike many others which vanished from online space after a few years of existence, delivering validated patient experience with professional guarantee, serving patients, caregivers, their beloved as well as community, but also medical students, healthcare professional as a guide through living with particular health condition. This huge repository of patient experience collected and processed with such high standard is a precious resource for science also. I try to find out how DPEX contributed to the body of, the, of the research knowledge, wondering why I couldn't find a hint in health psychology journals. Searching in Web of Science, I found up to 70 research papers published, some of them introducing DPEX methodology or evaluating the database of patients' experiences, some of them on utilizing utilization on this database in research, teaching or service improvement, but most of them contributing to our understanding of patients' ex experience with illness. But there are much more research papers listed on the DPEX website directly. Let's pick up some of them. Sylvia Jaworska and uh, uh, Kat Ryan reanalyze a large corpus of narratives collected within DPEX and try to find out how men and women talk about pain in, in authentic co uh, context of real pain experience due to chronic or terminal illness. Women refer to pain more frequently, using richer vocabulary, perceiving pain as something one has to cope and live with it, while men refer to pain using strong expressions, being mainly concerned with easing pain mostly with the help of painkillers. From this study we could learn that both men and women use simple vocabulary when talking about pain that might have implication for pain assessment tools. And also that men should be encouraged to disclose pain before they are incapacitated. And women should be taken seriously despite their way of describing pain being less expressed. Approximately one in nine women develop breast cancer and quarter of them do so while having a children living at home, so the whole family go through this life situation with them. Gillian Forrest, with her colleagues, analyze interviews with fathers and children, focusing also on disparities in their views. The fathers and children expected that the father would take over at home. Uh, fathers were familiar with this task, but they struggle with the complexity of arrangement, they, uh, the lack of information about what to expect from the treatment, and because they were under considerable emotional stress themselves. Father and children were unprepared for the changes in their mother's energy levels and emotions. Fathers were keen to reassure and protect children, but often lack sufficient information about illness, treatment, side effects. They sometimes fail to recognize the extent of their children's distress and interpret it like bad behavior. But they don't want to talk directly with clinician as they don't want to claim their precious time. Do you know what leads men to choose watchful waiting rather than active treatment for prostate cancer? 
The choice of treatment is very controversial because we are unsure if it really helps and because the possible side effects are incontinence and impotence, what, which might jeopardize the quality of life uh, in patients. Patients reported that they feel considerable pressure from family members, doctors and support groups to seek active treatment and those opting for watchful waiting had found doctors who supported their decision had assessed evidence from internet and were aware and concerned about side effects and uncertain outcome of the treatment. I scanned most of these research papers and it was a fascinating reading uh, that I could easily draw in four months. Imagine how rich the material collected within DPEX network is. Taking into account strict implementation of DPEX methodology, generating interview transcripts that are unique in the depth of the inquiry. 14 countries, nearly 200 health conditions, explored 8,000 interviews, and still I couldn't find any hint in health psychology journals. I might have overlooked some which didn't use a DPEX keyword, but anyhow, it seems to me that this territory was not discovered by health psychology yet. I want to close my presentation with some personal words. I was approached to deliver this keynote the year my father passed away, after two and a half years living with a terminal stage of bubble cancer. This is one of our very last photographs. He wanted me to study medicine as he was not allowed by the communistic regime due to religion. I prefer psychology over medicine when choosing to study because I found medicine too far away from people's experience. I was wrong. Medicine needs to be based on people's experience, needs to be as close as possible to people, and it could be. We, health psychologists, need to support healthcare pro workers as much as possible to develop and maintain narrative capacity. We owe it to the patient, our beloved, to all of us. And patient stories are a key. Thank you very much for your attention.